Montana, and it really doesn't get a whole lot better than that. So, so I have very fond memories of, of working in this uh, area in, uh, in these rocks. And also, since I was unemployed and came in, and Mark Miller gave me a job, and you know, I got a chance to work with Sam Porter, it was like kind of a little a life saving event, too. So, it, was, it worked out really well. Uh, okay, what I want to talk to you today about is this uh, Great Falls Tectonic Zone. Um, not that I've worked anywhere near Great Falls, but I've worked quite a bit along this. Uh, might say on strike into Idaho, and so I kind of thought I'd sort of bring our perspective from Idaho back this direction and and uh, and see what we know about this. Um, I want to also acknowledge Jeff Revort, Rich Gashnig, and Andrew Jansen, who um, help been helping with some uh, uh, geocron work uh, that I think sheds quite a bit of light on the situation here. Okay, so what? Fall tectonic zone and why do we care? So uh, basically um, located roughly, and I'll show you actually kind of shifts around depending on who talks about it, but basically roughly running from Boise on up to uh, Great Falls in, in this direction. And what I'm showing on here are, are basement rocks. So these are the, the Archean and, and Paleoproterozoic basement underlying the belt supergroup uh, and everything else for that matter around here. Um, and one of the points I think I want to make on this talk is that while, you know, we've got basement rocks down here in Wyoming, lots of them in Colorado, you get up, in, up into, uh, you know, this part of Montana, and they start getting pretty, pretty scarce. And so I think we've got to be very careful when people start, you know, saying, okay, I've got a date here, or I've got a structure here, or something like this, and the next one's, you know, quite a long ways away. We're playing with a very, very small number of, of exposures of these basement rocks. So I think that's important because... This has been thought to be a really old basement structure, the Cambrian basement structure. Okay, let's go through some of the, just uh, start out with just a little bit of the history behind this before I start talking about some of the field work I've done in Idaho and the dating we've done in Idaho. Uh, but this is basically uh, um, the figure that, um, that uh, O'Neill and Lopez published in 85, outlining this Great Falls tectonic zone right through here. They have pointed out that there's this um, big shear zone up here in, in Canada separating the Churchill province and Superior province. So they were speculating that, that we were looking at, at possibly uh, essentially the northwest edge of the Wyoming province, um, basically in here and having this shear zone coming through there. This is the, um, in that same paper, this is the actual fault that they had identified and liniments and trends and so on that they were they were looking at, and as you can see, coming down uh, Boise, Idaho, there's a Custer Grob and a variety of, of, of faults in here. The Boulder Brathwaite sort of a line northeast. It gets a little sketchier up here. Uh, there's this one fault shown here, a trend shown there, 
Um, and then they show a few things coming down out of out of Canada there. At about the same time, um, Thor Kilsgaard with the U.S. Geological Survey was working on a project. Uh, it was the Chalice Cusp Map Project, a big mineral appraisal uh, project uh, undertaken by the USGS in central Idaho. Uh, for those of you who know what Chalice is, Chalice right here is the town of Stanley. Um, and this is the Chalice one by two degree quadrangle. And this just shows big fault systems that were uh, out during that project in the early to mid 80s. Uh, there's sort of a north south, north northeast trend off here in the west. And then there's this northeast system, and this is what's called the Trans Chalice Fault. Was a term used through here, some Graben, some another Graben over here, some Longgate Twin Peaks Caldera, more fault, more fault up in this area. So for, more or less at the same time, uh, that mapping was going on. And then also um, there was quite a bit of, of discussion as to how this system. Here's the Trans. Uh, Chalice Fault System, Boise Basin, Idaho City down here, continuing on up to Leesburg, Gibbonsville, Montana line would be about right here. And people were pointing out how much mineralization there was along this zone. And, and in fact, there was a meeting, um, um, a tobacco route, a geological site meeting that focused basically on this, uh, and it was in Salmon in 1990. Okay. A little bit later on, uh, Mike O'Neill, 98, uh, had put out this map. Um, here's the Idaho Basilisk, the center lobe with the Idaho Montana border here. And talked about this feature in here as being a suture between um, two pre Cambrian blocks of rock here. And, and noted, this has been noticed actually a long time ago, but you've got this, this uh, zone of, of metamorphism down here in the Tobacco Root Mountains. Which he thought was, um, you know, associated with the juxtaposition of these two uh, basement plots. And here's the cross section that he that he, he drew um, in this paper. And basically, um, here's the Archean, the Wyoming province here, the Archean Herm province here, the suture in here. So bringing basically two big blocks of rock here together. Um, back in the Precambrian. And then more recently, the work by uh, Foster and other folks at um, uh, University of Florida, again, looking at blocks that they think are, are these you know, Precambrian blocks, Hearn, now we have a name for this piece south of the Hearn, the Medicine Hat, um, Great Falls Tixonic. So as you see here, it actually has kind of shifted from being that thing that was kind of up by it falls, it's kind of drifted a bit to the east. So this really isn't at all coincident with those faults that were originally mapped um, or, or postulated by um, um, O'Neill Lopez. And importantly, this tectonic zone has started to take on kind of a, an area or a map, a boundary. In other words, it has a, two sides to it. Instead of just a bunch of shears, it's actually now kind of a domain of relatively young rock See, you've got uh, 1.8 billion to 1.77 in this zone, and then older rocks in the Wyoming Craton and older rocks in the Med Imps and Hat. Okay, and I think that's an important uh, distinction or important change in, the, in thinking um, of this of this zone. Um, even more recently, worked by um, O'Neill, but also joined by uh, Sims and Lund. So this is more USGS. Uh, work where basically here's the Idaho border right here, and they have um, the Great Falls shear zone now back off to the west here, which is more or less um, where the original Great Falls tectonic zone was located in the original mapping. Um, and then they have this Trans Montana fold and thrust belt out to the southeast. Okay, and then various um, here's the Wyoming Craton. Point being, again, that's the Wyoming Craton and then other different rocks off to the northwest. In that same publication, um, again, you end up with um, the zones having, in this case, this green, a stark green, a magmatic arc terrain, 1.9 to 1.85 GA, having some 
northwest and southeast dimensions to it, okay? So um, instead of just a simple shear zone, this is basically a magma, uh, thought to be a magmatic arc terrain um, running along in a northeast direction there. And again, they speculate on the ore deposit connections. In this case, they're talking about um, uh, they, they have two different categories. So basically, all the little blue dots are, are, are uh, occurrences, metal occurrences, not necessarily productive mines, I don't think, but, um, but anyway, occurrences. And they're pointing out that you know quite a few of them show up basically on or near this, this uh, magmatic arc terrain, although obviously things are a little more complex than that. They're getting outside the zone a little bit. Okay, so that's sort of the history of what people have said about it. Now I want to tell you a little bit about what I've seen and what I know about it. Um, and I didn't have time to make the plot, but basically starting in Boise and running to Great Falls, the amount I know about this zone just steadily drops, okay? And so once I get into Montana, I'm really out on a limb. I can tell you, at least I can get you to the Montana line with some, some confidence here. Uh, so here's Boise. This is the state geologic map of Idaho. Here's Here's, um, probably don't know where any of these places are. Stanley's just off here. Here's the South Fork, the Payette River. Basically, we have this series of trendy shear zones cutting the pink unit here, which is Idaho Baffle, Southern Lobe of Idaho Baffle. So we know that these shear zones are actually post dating the late Cretaceous Baffle. Okay. And in fact, they also cut some of the Eocene plutons, which are here in this uh, brighter red color. Okay. So some of this movement is also, um, you know, Eocene or, or, or even potentially, potentially younger. Um, nice, nice linear valleys in here. So that's a, this is a south fork. This is a south fork of the <coughs> path there. And these valleys right here are the, or the, the main trace of the fault. But it's a very interesting area because there's these, basically this whole zone is crushed and altered rock. Here and there's these huge white patches where there's nothing growing. You get a lot of land, uh, a lot of debris flows and slides and stuff off. It. So lots of, of uh, crushed rock, a lot of alteration. And here's that shot from the helicopter looking down off at one of these spaces. Uh, the dark zones are are um, uh, dikes that are you can see little offsets of the dikes here there and virtually no vegetation on this. This is Every time they get a big rainstorm up here, uh, the south fork just turns brown, it's just mud brown because of all the material coming out there. Thor Kilsgar and I were walking out along this ridge here, actually almost crawling along this ridge, and there was a there was a big fir tree, big dug fir tree, maybe I don't know, 300 years old or whatever, something like that, that had three of the roots were exposed. Okay, that it just basically, so this tree was right on the crest of the ridge, okay, and three feet of material had been removed since that tree started growing. So even if it's like a 500 year old tree or whatever, we're talking serious amounts of erosion here. And also there's hot springs. This is the Kirkham Hot Springs. I'm not convinced that all of these are along necessarily the Trans Chalice Faults. A lot of them are along the North South Faults, but you also get quite a few hot springs along the, these structures. I think. So I think they're pretty steep structures going down some distance. Okay, if you come uh, from Stanley then, we're basically what I was just showing you was down off to the southwest here from Stanley. If you come back um, up and stay uh, west of Chalice, northwest of Chalice, uh, get in orange here are the Chalice Volcanics. And then in these greens and browns are, are the Belt Supergroup equivalent rocks. Um, and then this is basalt over here, and basically you start you start getting these grobbins dropping the chalice down in here, and up in here. Okay, so again, these northeast trending structures in this area are pretty young. This is a USGS map of the Salmon National Forest. Um, the, the town of Salmon is off to the east here. This is the Bear Track uh, Mine. Um, this is the Panther Creek Fault, which is one of these structures that has been proposed to be a, um, you know, part of this trans Chalice Fault Zone, which would be also part of that Great Fault um, Tectonic Zone. This one I'm kind of skeptical about. Um, 
you can see it doesn't really offset any of the Precambrian rock units coming through here at all. Um, admittedly, Panther Creek is kind of straight, but I'm not sure that that's such a big player in here. A bigger player, I think, is this hot springs fault up here. Um, so I think of some of this trans chalice movement is stepping off to the north and to the west um, up into this area. Uh, <clears throat> I think the Bear Track Mine is really interesting because it's actually, I can't quite see it, but it, there's a fault that's dotted um, right in through here on the USGS map. And I, I wouldn't be surprised actually if that doesn't turn out to be kind of a bigger structure possibly hooking down into this here. And the Bear Track Mine is basically right where there's a slight bend in the fault. And we see that this has got, you've got Cretaceous age on the Cerasite here, and we get gold mineralization in a lot of places in the Cretaceous, and a couple of the bigger deposits are right in bends in uh, what I think would probably moving that would strike flip motion in them. And uh, so I, I haven't done any work in here, I'm just speculating, but I kind of wonder if the Panther Creek fault is a little bit of a red herring here, and people maybe start to maybe look into the south there. Okay, so the trans chalice I was just showing you, basically Stanley's right in here, so it's showing you these grovins up through here. Um, I think the fault steps um, off here a little bit more to the west and are out into this area. The strong northeast grain is, is right in here, not so much in this salmon area. So I don't think that this zone comes right up through here. I think it actually starts stepping off to the to the northwest. You all just, you know, probably most of you are familiar with the Basin and Range, uh, beautiful valleys over here around Chalice, uh, the Pesimaroi Valley uh, right here. We've got a series of northwest trending normal faults uh, down on the southwest side. So here's one of them right here, down the southwest side, popping these basins down, uh, raising the ranges up. Those come up here as a Chalice, and then they pretty much die out. You don't see any of that Basin and Range looking stuff right here. And I don't think it's an accident that you've got this trans chalice fault zone uh, here and that's ending there. I think what's happening is it's transferring that this extension to the northeast and the southwest. It's potentially more of a strike slip motion along some of these northeast trending faults in, in this area. A lot of action in the last month down by chalice. We're getting a bunch of little earthquakes, not very big, but but it, you can feel them in chalice, and I think that's basically at the northern end of this structure here, um, but may also be near where some of this northeast activity has, has been happening in through here. Okay, this is where I start to go out on a limb here. Because I moved to Montana. But uh, basically, we sort of left off with a bunch of faults coming up uh, west of Lost Trail Pass here, and you've got the Big Hole Valley, and you've got these northeast structures that make up the, you know, there's the Anaconda detachment, kind of wraps around into that. So it looks pretty good until you get butt into here. And then it becomes very difficult to project much of a northeast trending structure, I think, you know, out into this country, at least as being as young as the, what we see to the south. Like I said, the stuff to the south, we're seeing even Eocenes, um, you know, rocks being faulted, you know, so on and so forth. Um, if you had some big Eocene faults running up through here, you've got rocks that are older than Eocene in this area, you should see something. And uh, so, um, and, and O'Neill and Lopez mentioned the fact that there's not a whole lot of, you know, evidence uh, for action up in, up in here. So if it does continue, it certainly has to have been older. Another thought. Um, that I've had is here's this Lewis and Clark fault zone coming over here. It looks pretty prominent on this map. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I had an ancient basement structure coming up from the northeast here, but what I wouldn't actually go over here someplace to look for it anyway. I'm not sure that would necessarily continue across that continue across that zone. Okay, let's move on now to some of the data that um, O'Neill and Lopez were talking about. They also and mapping out those faults that they showed. They also put together this map with basically uh, magnetic anomalies, um, gravity anomalies, you know, Pigate gravity anomalies, showing this northeast grain in through here, like going down into the salmon area, but there's also sort of a northwest grain as well. I really like these air mag maps. 
Uh, you can just sit there at these, I think, all day long. Yeah, I don't think we know what they mean, but they're really cool. Um, here's, here's um, so basically, here's sort of the big picture. So you see these big, uh, these big sort of structural grain or magnetic grain, um, you know, something like this, sort of sweeping around here, um, you know, several sort of parallel magnetic highs. Then you got this thing here, kind of a north northwest high, going like that. Um, so this, this. Great Falls tectonic zone, if it has an area, it's been postulated as something like, you know, this area right in here. But, you know, I think you could start drawing lines kind of like this. I'm not sure you necessarily need to say that's going to connect into any of this stuff right here. So the Canadians have uh, been using this stuff a lot for, for a long, long time to help them map up in Alberta and places where their rocks are covered, base rocks are covered. Um, it's kind of hard to see where the heck you are on this thing, but um, this is the Wyoming province here, the WP, Great Falls Tectonic Zone. Again, here giving, a, you know, you sort of have an edge to it, all right? And then up into this medicine hat block, the Vulcan structure is right up in there. The point that they make in this paper, this is a thousand paper, um, is that basically they say, well, you know, they think some of these structures basically come right through here, okay, that they don't see necessarily evidence for some kind of a truncation on this northeast, on this northeast grain. Same with the, with the regional uh, gravity here. There, here's the Great Falls Tectonic Zone, and they're saying, well, you know, not terribly convinced this is, you know, somehow being truncated or somehow greatly different. And when they look at just the light, long wavelength uh, data, um, here's the Wyoming province again, Great Falls Tectonic Zone, Medicine Hat Block. It's pretty hard to, you know, put some kind of a northeast structure you know, through there. This is the big component right here that nobody seems to be talking about. But, um, I mean, if you're just intro level geophysics, I would say that's the one you're, you know, should be looking at here. You're having a hard time running stuff up through this. Okay, one of the things I do when I'm mapping, I actually got started doing this, trying to tell different plutonic rock types apart, is do magnetic susceptibility. It's basically fundamental how much magnetizes in these rocks. We take a little magnetic susceptibility meter and, and take a um, As it turns out, the Eocene granodiorites are loaded with magnetite. Okay, so this would be something that would give you a nice air mag high. On the granites are too. They don't have any mafic minerals in them, but what little they have tends to be magnetite. So this is uh, low, low hot springs pluton. There's some neoproterozoic diorites in central Idaho. These things are just loaded actually with magnetite, actually a lot of ilmenite in some of them. This is on Big Creek, central Idaho in the wilderness, and, and uh, this is the easternmost of one of those plutons right here. Shows up nicely on the map. Not, we don't have a lot of Arcan in Idaho, but um, this is up by Priest River, and again, um, this is an orthonite, 2.6 zillion year old orthonite that was uh, dated by um, Ted Dowdy, and uh, and Cham Dowdy and Chamberlain, I believe, or possibly Parrish. Anyway, again, this thing has got a lot of magnetite in it. Okay. Um, as are some of the younger orthonites. This is up by Coeur d'Alene. Uh, the hill, we now know the rocks just immediately south of Coeur d'Alene and those road cuts turn out to be Paleoproterozoic orthonites and Archean um, amphibolite. And the orthonites have um, magnetites in them that even, you know, like old guys with me with glasses like this can see. So they're big, big magnetites. And so I think that's when you're looking at these maps. So coming back then to just a regional air mag map, this time zooming in just on Idaho. So here's the Idaho border here. Here's Superior, here's Salmon, Chalice, Big Creek. Um, and here, that neoproterozoic diorite I was showing you, that's this guy right here. So that's on that, that's that Northwest trend right here. Um, uh, some of these are a lot, most of these down here are the Eocene plutons that we get in Southern Idaho, South Central Idaho. Um, some of these, I'm not quite sure what they are. This is out in the middle of nowhere. This is, this is we need to get Jeff Lawn on this. This is out his back door. Wilderness, I'm not sure on that one. Could be a big Eocene structure, could be something else. Um, 
But fundamentally, when you start getting this far south and west into Montana and into Idaho, you know, we just have a lot of these plutons that are really young and they're really, you know, I think they're, you know, it's not telling us a heck of a lot about what the base is fundamentally. Okay. Now, there are places, like I said, up in northern Idaho where we do have Archean and Paleoprotic basement with magnetic highs. And those are right up in here. Unfortunately, there's also tertiary plutons in there, so they're kind of stepping on top of one another. So <laughs> I think that's what giving that air mag high right there. So I guess, again, you know, if you take all the lines off that other people have drawn and start drawing your own lines, you know, um, I kind of see nice big swoopy things here. Um, not, I don't see necessarily something going like that. Okay, so again, back to this this figure, um, the the idea of having uh, you know the, this block being different from that block. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, look at the ages they're showing here. Not you know, greater than 2.5 to me is the same as 2.6 to 3.3. Um, so that's still I think an open question for the state of Montana. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of this is all these rocks are covered. You got to get that out of drill hole data. There's not a lot of data for the medicine hat. So. <clears throat> okay, the um, Tekla Harms has been promoting this this concept of a of a big sky orogeny, and this really goes back to that figure I showed from O'Neill from '98, where you've got the, the tobacco roots, you've got this uh, metamorphic event in here, um, and the, uh, what she's calling the Great Falls Tectonic Zone here coming down something like this, just northwest of it. But this is, you know, this is a, you know, a little bit younger story here than the um, ages of the of the Pluto stuff in the Little Belt Mountains. In fact, I should probably back up here just so I can do that. It's Great Falls Tectonic Zone, the dates that Foster and others have gotten. This 1.86 is really important. Okay, there's several Plutons of that age. But then they show this ranging all the way down to 1.77 okay, as this zone. Okay, so that's a long period of time, really. Um, and I'm not so sure, but what the 177 is in the big story here as far as the, the fault zone. And so I think this big question is real and it's really, it's really important. What's not real, in my view, is this concept of having a of a uh, basically this arc. Remember those those, um, those slides that had the basically sort of an area in here, which was this 1.86 or 1860 MA magmatic arc, being called the Little Belt Arc. Okay, um, that's that's restricted to the Great Falls Tectonic Zone. And the reason I say that is is that we're now finding same age rocks that have been found here and here. Okay. We'll find them there, we'll find them there, the Canadians have got them up here, okay? And this comes back to my point of we don't have a whole lot of rock to look at, okay? If you look, we get a star on basically every one of the basement exposures around here, okay? And so you just, I mean, basically it's like, okay, only 5% of the outcrop is there, let's go and date it and boom, and okay, and well, if it happens that you just date this one and this one, then you get a northeast trend. Okay, if you date just that one and that one, there's a northwest trend. Okay, but those trends are actually just a function of much younger geology, much younger faulting that has brought these basement rocks up. Okay, so you could just as easily collect, connect these three stars and say that there's a 1860 arc running that way. Okay, as opposed to running this way. So I just want to show you just a few of the, some of the data. So this new dating that's been done at WSU for this area up in here, and it's going to show you some examples of the rocks from that Clearwater complex. This is what they look like. They're tonelitic, uh, nice, so nice. Um, one granite, but most of them are tonelite. And here, this particular one came out at 1854. We've got lots of them. Each one of these is an analysis. Um, and, and the mean is about 1858, if you call it 1860. 
something like that. Lots of them. Archean, a little bit more banded rock and not as common, um, but uh, got a 2651, 2660 ages on those. Like I say, not so many, but again, about 2.6 billion or so. Okay, so what this is going to take a second here, but what this shows is um, a compilation of ages. So I was kind of looking at that map that Foster and others had, you know, it says Wyoming's this, and the medicine hat is that, and this is that. And I was having trouble understanding why people were drawing lines around those blocks. So what I did is go in and, with the help of a student, um, Andrew, um, basically compile the ages for um, from the northwest up in Canada, the Monashis, basically kind of south and east to the Wyoming province in a general general way. Okay, and then here is age. Okay, so what I was just showing you was from the Clearwater Complex in Idaho, and here's this 1.86 story, and then here's the Archean story, the 2.6 story out in here. You can see Monashis very similar. This this one. Six medicine hat block, no, only some of this older stuff. But again, not many analyses. I wouldn't be surprised if people could get a little bit more drill core from there. Boom, you'd have some over here too. Okay, just not enough data. Priest River complex, we're getting now both the two six and the one eight six. Like I said, Clearwater complex, the Little Belt Pioneer Mountains, all coming in with this younger age. Um, although I think in the Big Belt, there's a thesis that was just completed that um, has an Archean. I want to say, actually, they've got one poorly constrained Archean, too, actually, in the Little Belt Mountains. So basically, from the Monashies down at least into sort of central, north central Idaho and uh, into the Little Belt, a pattern developing. A little bit different as we go south into Idaho. Um, we're not picking up this this young component um, until you get clear over to the Black Hills. And then the Wyoming province is missing that 186, and then it's just got a pile, pile of other older rocks in it. Okay. People also started looking at, at uh, for, I don't know, it's been 10, 15 years now, I should say, at the cores, ages of the cores, inherited cores in zircon in granitic rocks, particularly the Idaho Babylon. So if you got a, you know, you're missing your base, you got this huge bunch of plutonic rock, what are you going to do about imaging that basement, where it came from, what it's come up through? And this is pretty amazing uh, work that's being done now. People can, you know, basically use a laser, zap a 30 micron across hole, get an age for these things. And what's turning out is you get these old, um, oftentimes you get these old core, here's one 2552 core, here, um, here's a 2575 core here, and then a, then a Cretaceous rim, 67 million year old Cretaceous rim growing around it. This is exactly why it took forever to get Idaho Basil stated, okay? Because if you were to grind these, you know, up and analyze those, you'd get a kind of a weird average age out of all that, okay? But now they're actually being able to date individual domains within these zircons. What it shows is the southern part of the basalt has got, um, you know, quite a bit of old, this old 262526, this, this um, Archean age, okay, and then a big gap in here, not a lot of ages until you get down to Grenville ages, on, you know, or even, or say belt and Grenville ages, and then of course a lot of Cretaceous ages as well, as opposed to the northern part of the basket where, you know, um, you do get a lot of the 186 material coming in here. So quite a quite a change. I'll show this in a different way, maybe a little more clear. Um, there seems to be kind of a line here through the through the southern lobe of the basket. And um, um, at the very southern end you get an age distribution like this which is basically sort of this bimodal thing with none of these, um, you know, 1860 kind of ages. And you go north of that line, and all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of that stuff. Okay, so very different 
age uh, distribution here and the inheritance from down here to up, to up here. Well, that kind of fits in a general way where this, you know, this Great Falls Tectonic Zone slash Trans Chalice Fault Zone should go through. Not exactly, but it, you know, so maybe there is something to this. You know, I think there's actually more difference down here between these two domains than what you guys are seeing up in the Great Falls area. Okay, so there might you know, there might be something to this. This may actually be the northwest edge of the Wyoming craton <coughs> right in through that zone. All right. So just to conclude here, then um, you can you can map this this uh, trans chalice and the Great Falls uh, tectonic zone basically from Boise to Butte, okay? And it's in rocks that are pretty young, you know, Eocene rocks. That's something you can go out, you can see, you can map. Okay. From northeast of Butte and into the Great Falls area, you know, good luck. It just doesn't, in my view, anyway, never having tried to go out there. And Maps it, but I kind of trust some of the people here that have been mapping out there. Um, I think you would see it. Okay. If those are fish faults out there, they're not very good. Let's just say. Um, it may well mark the northwest extent of Wyoming province. Okay. Um, I don't know that for sure, but certainly in Idaho, um, like it was shown the zircons, um, it. Uh, it's suggestive anyway that you seem to be going into some other basement domain as you go as you go to the northwest. Like I said earlier, the view of the basement structures is really skewed by the exposure patterns, and those patterns have, you know, a lot of it has to do with where the metamorphic core complexes are that have brought these basement rocks up. Okay, and so if you get a date from one of those things, great. Go down the road. You date another one. You got two points. You got a line, but you better better be careful with with that sort of thing. Okay. To me, this is the one point I really want to emphasize: is that this 60 magnetism is widespread in North America. So I showed you the stars, you know, in Montana where those were were, but really. I mean, you go into this mid-continent, you go up into Canada, I mean, this is like a huge, huge thing happening, you know, really worldwide, okay? So to say that you guys have got your own little 1860 arc going up to Great Falls, I think it's, it's a mistake. I think it's, I think it's a much bigger feature than that, and uh, it's, not, it's not just restricted to that one zone. So I would say that there's really no evidence for a little bell arc parallel to the Great Falls Tectonic Zone. And if there isn't a tectonic zone, it's just that I'm not sure there's necessarily a magmatic arc that falls along that zone. I think this big sky orogeny is, is a big deal, but it's on the, you know, it's almost 100 million years plus or minus younger than this. Well, a lot of can happen in 100 million years, okay? And I think that's the one that may have brought some of these things you know, together, um, and and it's real, and it's, and it's why we have a lot of those north that northeast grain. Um, but just I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a closed, you know, some kind of arc that's basically closed closed up in a simple in a simple matter like that. And that's it. That's Thor Kills Guard, was 1980. And uh, so that's Thor's land. That's the backside of the Trans and the Trans Chalice Fault System is just off to the off to a little bit to the north. So that's all I have. I got plenty of time for. <laughs> Certainly one down here. <laughs> From an economic standpoint, it seems like there's lots of evidence for the line called mineralized caldera that moves on these implications. Right. All the way from Boise. Yeah. Yeah. So, just from that standpoint, yeah. structural control, innovation, yeah. that's, that's believable. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. 
in full sunlight used to here, but, but maybe extending it up in the Alcala province. So, yeah, it's, it's a little shaky. Yeah, just from the economic standpoint, yeah. what's yeah. real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I do think that we do have to keep in mind the. I see, you know, like at Stidnight, for example, um, the Elk City District, or the north south structures, like I showed it on that um, first slide where I showed, you know, Thor's map, the northeasters, and then to the west, or sort of that north right. south grain, north northeast grain. And some of the biggest gold production is actually coming for a lot of, you know, not as significant, come along with that zone, too. So, um, but I know I would agree. And, and I mean, and there's clearly gold associated with the ESD event itself. Did you just know about all that? It kind of looked in, in the slide that showed the blue occurrences that there might be north <laughs> northwest trend within the zone. Yeah. There might be some sort of extension of the structures yeah. within the larger technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the point people have been making about the zone is that it's, you know, it's the right fertile rocks or whatever to start with, too. Um, but uh, I'm, and I wouldn't even argue with that point. The one point, though, I would argue with is that that's some kind of a uh, Taylor Protocol part. Yeah. I'm not convinced. Um, the basement range valley, south of the wall, zone and trench channels are they're really active. Mm -hmm. So if there's all this active extension, it's somehow being accommodated and all that. Right. Structure on the hills more Well, I think it's hard to recognize in that country an active structure. <coughs> Much easier to recognize an active and normal. So I would argue that if those things come up, you're getting mostly strike flip along that now. So what was, you know, before we had robins and so on forming, you know, during the Eocene in that northeast orientation, I would argue now that this could well be a strike circle on that zone. If you move, especially if you step out of the Montana and you move some of that, that uh, basin range action out to the north east. And I think it would be hard to see that. Um, even Boris Peak Scarf is going fast. And, you know, if you just go out and look at what happens if you fall scarf in the ditch If you move them strike foot, I'm not sure, but five years later, you'd even be able to know that. I don't know. Hmm. Um, well, you, and, uh, you're you talking know, about self graphics or whatever. Yeah. Like that, but yeah. how about, is there any, I mean, there's no active seismicity along that? You, you mentioned. Well, there is. Right at, you know, right at Chalice, like right now, happening the last few weeks, there's seismicity along there. Um, and so. I guess the question would be, is that just simply the northern tip of the Bora Peak action that's propagating north, or is it somehow related to, you know, possibly starting this, um, you know, starting the transfer? Um, and I don't have that, I don't know the answer. It could be one of the other, but it seems, it seems to me odd that it would the basement range falls to sort of stop. Unless there's somehow a got a Check that motion has There's not a lot of great um yeah. He's the one who always tells us about our field or something. Yeah. Because he because we have a lousy he always tells us right away what's happening in Idaho. And he can tell you all about that. That what's happening right now in Chalice, and that might give some clues as to what you should be looking for on the ground out there. Because folks from Utah come up and put in some more. Should get some good. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're getting pure. You know, the solutions aren't all get split solutions on that Chalice for. Well, I think there are strikes, but some strikes. Are strikes. Are strikes. Are strikes. Are strikes. That's what I would expect. Some strikes. I, if, if there was all this 1860 magnetism, isn't, isn't that one of the big pieces of the belt for trying to serve con? Actually, strangely, no. Is it, um, there's a big 1800 piece in a lot of the courts. 
And then if you get into the art of vision, you get like a Kinnikinnik, I think it shifts like, like 1840. But not the 1860, it's kind of weird. But I think what happens a lot of times is when the sediments come in, they just don't rework the stuff. They just come in from who knows where and they just dump it. Because the Cambrian in northern Idaho applies um, uh, Ponderay Lake, the, the port sites there. Nothing but 1800 reserve on And no belt just on the They didn't recycle one surf on <laughs> So it's kind of like. Somehow the sediment just kind of comes in and very carefully fell down and, and you don't see it. Um, can we go get Dave Foster's map? Does anyone suggest that there's some kind of a basement structure along the Montana Idaho boundary there, and he he actually I mean he's got that it's based on some. Uh, uh, are you talking now about this thing? Yeah, so he's notice that he's pretty pretty noncommittal about what exactly is going on. Right. Uh, in Idaho. Yeah, so this is that Farmington zone, and they have some yeah. dates I think down by um, Salt Lake City <laughs> that they've used to. Um, to you know, define this as being somewhat younger. So they've got this is older than yeah, coming up here. But then basically you've got again, here's your control problem. I mean, basically you've got these little blobs here, and then absolutely nothing until you get to there. And you guys, you know, think we're playing and everything. So to start projecting this very far in any one direction is, I think. Again, kind of sketchy. Well, I know that one of his data points is in the Pioneer Basilisk, where he was looking at potassium ratios or something like that, and looking at basement signatures. Right, right into in, yeah. there, and that's yeah. why he puts that big 90-degree bend in there because he. Yeah, he, he had a different. That. The pluton was on the east was different from the pluton right, on the west. Right, 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 right. 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 Yeah. And maybe, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm I'm not opposed to that. Well, I just wonder how much this you know, tertiary and quaternary brittle faulting, I mean, maybe it's not related to basement structures at all. Maybe. Yeah. Right. Is that kind of maybe. where you're yeah. going? I mean, I don't think we know. I sort of, my feeling is we just need to back off just a little bit here. I mean, I think we just don't quite get this thing yet. And, I, and there's a couple things. Or one thing I'm pretty sure it's not is an 1860 arc. Beyond that, I think we just really don't know. I have another one. Okay. Um, you heard about these lines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it was in one of those figures. Okay. But it's also, it sounds like a very similar boundary to what you find in the middle of that whole bathroom, but I don't remember how old it is. But it just, it, 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 it distinguishes, um, have you talked to Tecla Harm? Not um, much about this, no, no. <laughs> because I think that she would put everything to the northwest of Gillette's line as being part of the big sky erogeny, 0.7. Right. And then everything south of it as older and, and uh, based on a lot of redating of uh, and working of old radiometric dates. And I'm, yeah, no, I, I... It sounds like your boundary in Idaho. It sounds like the Idaho basilisk. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah potentially. Although it's, it's off there quite a ways from yeah. where it needs to be. But there may be a way to make yeah. that happen. But you can see, she's got the same... And basically, this is pretty similar to kind of what Mike O'Neill has put. she's changed her mind about that. Oh, this too. is... Okay. Yeah. Done deal. All right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you gotta go in the other way. Other way. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Anything else? It's uh, four time. <laughs> Thanks. All right. You bet.
There's so many different things that design that. Everybody's kind of using it for their own purpose. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they're moving around.